everybody. I'm going to talk to you about a little known painting by an artist who is little known in the UK. It's a painting which on first sight may seem formulaic, but as I'm going to explain, it gives an entry into two separate stories and the strands come together at Kenwood. So we'll start with Sir Godfrey Webster by Louis Gouffier. It's a painting which was not in the original Ivor Bequest, but it was purchased by English Heritage in 1999 for Kenwood and Battle Abbey with support from the National Art Collections Fund. I'll go into why it was bought for Battle Abbey in a minute, but first I want to explore why it was bought for Kenwood. It's a delicious link. The connection is Sir Godfrey Webster's wife, Lady Elizabeth Webster. This painting is by George Rumney. It's Lady Webster, and we're going to see a lot more of her in a minute. The connection is not just her, it's also George Romney himself. At this point, I'll just remind you that in all, Edward Cecil Guinness bought 22 paintings by George Romney from Agnews. And this was the second work by Romney that he bought very early on in April 1888. It's not a part of the original Ivor bequest for Kim Wood, but it remains in the Guinness family. It's very much of the same scale and style as the other full-length portraits of 18th century ladies, which you can find at Kenwood House. Lady Webster, afterwards Lady Holland, is integral to my story, and some of it revolves around this very picture. So bear with me, and all will become clear. So, the Kenwood interest in the painting by Gouffier is that Sir Godfrey Webster was the first husband of an extraordinary woman, as we will see someone who was close to Romney because she had repeated sittings for her full-length portrait, and also because Sir Godfrey Webster is portrayed in the painting I'm going to talk about today as the epitome of an 18th century gentleman. And Kenwood was left to the nation as a fine example of the artistic home of a gentleman of the 18th century. So now we'll go to Battle Abbey. Sir Godfrey Webster's family seat was Battle Abbey, the supposed site of the Battle of Hastings. Sir Godfrey Webster's grandfather had bought it in 1721. He was succeeded by his son, Sir Whistler Webster, second baronet, who married well, but who died childless in 1779. He and his widow, Lady Martha, who you can see here, are also relevant to the story. The estate passed to Whistler's brother, and then six months later, upon his death, to his nephew, Sir Godfrey Webster, in 1780. That is, our Sir Godfrey Webster, here on the bottom left. Other than a brief period of 40 years from 1857 to 1901, Battle Abbey remained in the Webster family until 1976, when it was sold to the government, and it's now run by English Heritage. Sir Godfrey Webster was MP for Seaford in Sussex, a rotten borough, and later for Wareham in Dorset. He was a notorious gambler and notoriously irascible with uncertain moods. It cost money to be an 18th century member of parliament, and despite his fortuitous financial family inheritance, Sir Godfrey Webster was to need more money to fund his habits. So, six years after inheriting Battle Abbey, in 1786, he married Elizabeth Vassell, an heiress. She was the only child of a Jamaican planter and slave owner. He was 38, she was 15. Apparently they got on reasonably well to start with, but the marriage fell to pieces, as I'll explain. They had five children, two of whom died at birth, in the six years between 1789 and 1795. In other words, by the time Elizabeth was 24. But there were problems in battle because the poker-faced Lady Martha, Whistler Webster's widow, good alliteration, who was 21 years younger than her husband and only died in 1810, age 80, refused to move out of the main house. The house fell into a seriously ruinous state the newlyweds had to live in a subsidiary property on the estate and it was damp and gloomy. 
the new Lady Webster, Elizabeth Vassell, took to sending across to the main house daily to ask if the old hag was dead yet. In 1791, after Webster's election defeat in Seaford, they traveled to the continent. I said just now that they had five children, but at least one of these children, possibly more, were not her husbands. It seems that as soon as they began traveling in Europe, they drifted apart. They visited France, Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. But Sir Godfrey returned to England for increasingly long periods partly due to his parliamentary ambitions, leaving Elizabeth in Europe. She was friends with the Duchess of Devonshire and the politician Thomas Pelham, with whom she had an affair and a daughter born in 1794. And then in 1794, when she was 23, Lady Webster met the Whig politician Henry Fox, third Baron Holland in Naples. He was two years her junior, only 21 years old, and they embarked on a scandalous love affair, which finally brought about the end of her marriage to Sir Godfrey Webster. It took three years to end it, and Webster divorced her on the 4th of July, 1797, on the grounds of adultery. Just two days later, back in England, she married Lord Holland. Remember that in 1797, when they married, she was still only 26 and Holland was 24. So here is the third person in this relationship, which made it a bit crowded. Henry Richard Fox, third Baron Holland. On the left, you can see him painted by François Xavier Fabre in 1795. And on the right, Gouffier's portrait of what was thought to be Lord Holland until 1949, when the identity was changed to an unknown young man in Florence. Fabre and Gouffier were the best of friends as French émigré painters in Florence, and I'll return to that connection later. For the moment, it's enough to say that Fabre painted no fewer than six portraits of Lord Holland, all of which he arranged to transport back to England for Lord Holland in 1796. Holland wears a thoughtful expression and a ring, which I've highlighted, possibly a reference to his intentions towards Lady Webster. Thomas Pelham, yes, the same man with whom Elizabeth Vassell, Lady Webster, had had an affair and a child, wrote in a letter in November 1796 about this particular Fabre portrait that the portrait for resemblance is everything his best friends could wish. In other words, to quote Angela's talk on Van Dyke a couple of weeks ago, it was a portrait where he had his best looks on. But let's return to the society beauty that Elizabeth was in the 1790s, in her teens and early 20s. Gouffier's portraits, one in an interior and one in a park, skillfully capture her charm. The painting of her in her poke bonnet remained in the Fox family until 1985. Romney's portrait of her as a worshipper of the sun stayed in the Fox family until 1887. It then was sold to Rothschild, then on to Agnews and then on to Guinness in 1888. Well, we haven't quite finished with Sir Godfrey Webster. He tried to unsuccessfully claim Gouffier's beautiful 1794 portrait of Elizabeth with her son and her spaniel, Pierrot. It's the same dog, by the way, in both portraits during the divorce. It doesn't take great psychoanalysis to work out that the fight was actually over the woman rather than the painting. One of the reasons it took Romney such a long time to paint his portrait of Lady Webster is that Sir Godfrey only ever paid him an initial half payment of £52. Another tussle over this painting ensued. When Lord Holland tried to obtain Romney's portrait from him, Webster challenged him to a duel. And of course, it wasn't just about the shame of being cuckolded, it was also about money. With her divorce, Elizabeth relinquished her Jamaican inheritance and made it over to Sir Godfrey a huge sum of £7,000. But that wasn't enough. 
desperately short of cash, addicted to drink and gambling, by now also suffering from syphilis and publicly humiliated, aged 52 years old, Sir Godfrey Webster killed himself in 1800. Lord and now Lady Holland lived together in Holland House in Kensington, which was then just outside London, and for many years hosted the elite of Whig society. Here they are in their maturity in a sketch by Landseer. She was one of the most celebrated society hostesses in Europe. In the end, they had seven children, two of whom died at birth and two of whom died young. These seven children are on top of the five children she gave birth to when she was married to Webster. So she had 12 children in all from at least three different fathers. The three children by Lord Holland, who did not die young, survived into their own old age. Lord Holland died in 1840 and Elizabeth, Lady Holland, finally died in 1845, aged 74. By the time of her death, she had become known for her domineering nature, in contrast to her second husband of for over 40 years. And she had also become estranged from her children and supposedly said to Lord John Russell, I hate my son, I don't like my daughter. The 1790s and her first husband must have seemed a long time ago to her by then. Here they all are, Elizabeth and her first husband, both painted by Gouffier in 1794, and her lover, soon to be her much longer second husband in 1795. There's a little bit more on the story of the Webster family, which I found on the UCL Legacies of British Slave Ownership database. The fifth baronet, also Sir Godfrey Vassal Webster, put in a claim for compensation as a slave owner under the Slave Compensation Act and appears to have succeeded in getting £5,000. It didn't come through until after his death in 1836, though, by which time he too had spent extravagantly, left debts, and had had to sell off much of the Battle Abbey estate. And it was a contested claim because after Arthur Godfrey's suicide in 1800, Lord Holland took Elizabeth's name vassal, and I quote, to safeguard his children's rights to his wife's West Indian fortune. And it looks as if he received 2000 pounds. So not a huge amount is known about Louis Gouffier. And most of what we know is from a very slim 20 page monograph originally published nearly 100 years ago in 1926 by Paul Marmotton. All this is set to change because there is a new monograph in production, but it's not yet published. I say this because some of the following may be subject to a few updates. Louis Gouffier was born in Poitiers on the 10th of June, 1762. He was the son of a worker in the naval dockyard at Rochefort. He was spotted, became a pupil at the Académie Royale in Paris and part of the circle of Jacques-Louis David. In other words, his paintings were neoclassical, embraced mythological and classical stories, used a strong color palette in a Poussin-esque way and contained strong architectural elements. In 1784, he won jointly with his friend Jean-Germain Drouet, the Prix de Rome, and they both spent the next four years at the Académie Française in Rome as the customary reward for winning the prize. He briefly returned to Paris in April 1789 in order to become accepted as a history painter at the Académie Royale. This, of course, was the top accolade as history painting was top of the categories of painting. But in 1789, the political situation in France was deteriorating rapidly. By March 1790, he was back in Rome when he married Pauline Chatillon, his pupil, and they had two children. You can see them all here in the Villa Borghese in this beautiful watercolor. I could find nothing out about Pauline, although I did read a suggestion that she might have painted the face of her husband in this picture. 
You may be wondering how ever any of the paintings by Gouffier I have shown you so far have any connection at all with David. So now I'll explain how. On the left is Gouffier's 1784 painting, which won him his passage to Rome. Coincidentally, David accompanied Gouffier and Rouet on their journey to Rome in 1784. On the right is a painting now in the National Galleries of Scotland of Cleopatra and Octavian, dated 1887 to 8. In fact, so close is it to the work of David that it was actually attributed to David until 1954. It's an example of how, during all his time in Rome, Gouffier sent back big history paintings to Paris for the Salon. But here is the problem. He was constantly ill. Most of what we know about him is thanks to the correspondence between the directors of the institutions in Rome and in Paris. And La Grenée Lenny, who was a director of the Académie Française at Rome, wrote of him to Dangeville. He is in ill health. When he has worked three or four days in a row, he is obliged to take a rest and is often ill. Sometimes he couldn't hand work in, he was too ill. In the same year, 1787, La Grenée had asked him to copy a fresco by Domenichino in Grotta Ferrata. He had done it and had immediately fallen into a high fever. It was quite usual that pupils at the Académie Française at Rome were requested to reproduce famous works of art in Rome and send them back to Paris for the royal collection. But after this painting was delivered in 1788, Lagrenet writes again, his weak and precarious health and a natural leaning towards simple, gentle subjects have forced him away from the more demanding studies which he could have continued in Rome. So he has gone to Naples. I cannot stress enough how important it was to French history painters to have their stay in Rome. This is what made them. David had won the Prix de Rome himself in 1774 and had made his first trip there in 1775. David made it his business to push against the establishment. Radical artists like David and his friends equated the bankruptcy of the system of artistic patronage with the bankruptcy of the political and social order. He understood that society was changing and he knew that the one instance where Le Peuple could look at his art was the Salon. The future lay in the unknown young artists returning from Rome. It was no longer the establishment which was admired, but David and his contemporaries. Gouffier and Rouet in 1784, and Fabre, also a pupil of David and who won the Prix de Rome in 1787, were on the coattails of this change. David Belisarius begging for arms marked his salon debut in 1781. His immediate audience was civil servants devoted to an ideal of state service. But David Belisarius shows the abandoned general finding refuge among the peasantry. It is no coincidence that Gouffier's Canaanite woman depicts the moment when Christ reaches out to all people, not just the Jews. Remember that this is 1784, before the revolution, when Gouffier was David's pupil and had not yet declared himself as a royalist. Here on the right, you can see the piece Gouffier sent to the Salon in 1791. The similarities to David's Belisarius and to the Oath of the Heratii are clear in terms of the color palette and the neoclassical construct, the gestures, drapery, the division of the painting, the overall rigor, the highly detailed fabrics worn by the women who have been hiding Achilles until he can't help himself drawing his sword, which flow across the picture plane, and the detailed architecture receding into the background of a wooded landscape, demonstrate Gouffier's skill as a neoclassical painter. So what happened for Gouffier to change tack? We already know he was often sickly, but then in 1793, Louis XVI was executed and anti-French sentiment in the Papal States took such a bad turn that Gouffier, along with other French emigres, including his good friend Fabre, fled to Florence. 
of all the artists in the Académie Française in Rome, only Gouffier and Fabre remained monarchists and refused loyalty to the Republic. Back in France, they are denounced by Vicar along with a whole slew of Ancien Regime artists. Gouffier is singled out as being painter for the vile Lord Harvey, ambassador of England, and a protégé of the so-called Prince Augustus, the bitter enemy of France. We'll see Prince Augustus again in a minute. After this, branded a royalist, Gouffier couldn't earn a living as a history painter. But he had to live by his art. He had no other income and neither did his artist wife. So in Florence, Gouffier turned to portrait painting and luckily for him, there was a steady flow of diplomats, travelers, and a little later when French troops occupied Florence, French officers. On and off over the last century, depending on the number of wars, Italy had seen a huge tourist trade of travelers on the Grand Tour. They wanted mementos of their travels, and this had been exploited early on by the vedutisti, or view painters. Here is a well-known painting by Giovanni Paolo Panini, who worked in Rome. His vistas of Rome, both antique and modern, show examples of what the traveler could buy to take home. This was something Gouffier could do with minimal stress and relative ease. He always used a canvas of about 65 centimeters by 50 centimeters, an odd size for a full length portrait, but very portable. What Florence lacked in antiquities, it made up for in its skyline. And this would have particularly resonated with British travelers. Brunelleschi's Duomo had already been effectively imported into Britain at the beginning of the 18th century by Lord Burlington and Robert Adams and William Chambers neoclassical architecture, which followed on from it, were part of the English vernacular by the end of the century. What better than to have a painting with a background of the real thing once you got back to England? You can see in all four of these examples, with their allusions to antiquity in the broken columns and pedestal, that the main thing they share is the Florence cityscape, with the Duomo and the Palazzo Vecchio and Fiesole in the background. By the way, there in the middle is Prince Augustus Frederick, the bitter enemy of France. And here is a detail of the Duomo from Dr. Penrose's portrait, but it is equally minutely picked out in them all. And while at a glance you might not think they bear much resemblance to his neoclassical paintings, you can see that Gouffier has adapted the techniques. He produces a theatricalized landscape. The sitter of the portrait is in the foreground as if on a stage, often with his attributes. For example, Van Wyck Cochlers, the miniaturist, has his portfolio propped up against the wall at his feet. But the sitter is not the only subject of the painting. The landscape is a place in which all these people have wandered and each picture unfolds in a series of layers. So in each picture, we have neoclassicism's mathematical description of space and closely detailed nature or landscape. But we also see in his choice of how to portray his subjects and in the way he paints, that Gouffier is leaning towards the romantic ideal and the depiction of nature in inverted commas, where men are free and good, untainted by the constraints of society. There's another layer to it too. Several artists in Rome were pioneers in the field of plein air painting. And here are examples of Gouffier's small landscapes and oil sketches. The diplomats were of all nationalities, but here are two Swedish diplomats whose connection is quite intriguing. On the right is Gustav Moritz Armfelt. He was best friend and confidant of the Swedish King Gustav III, who was assassinated in 1792. Armfelt was removed from the political scene by the nobles now in charge and appointed head of mission in Italy to keep him out of the way. His position was very fragile and he was spied upon by his fellow diplomats, among them 
Johann Claes Lagerswert, seen here on the left. Both paintings follow the same pattern of theatricalization of the sitter. Armfelt is clearly depicted more naturally. This portrait is less about absolute historical truth than about how Armfelt wished to be portrayed. He is shown in front of Le Cascine, a beautiful park on the north bank of the Arno, pensively holding a book. It's Voltaire's La Mort de César. He's dressed wearing his Swedish orders and he's looking at two busts, one of Julius Caesar and one of Gustav III. The parallels are clear. Caesar was a political martyr and so was Gustav III. My personal view is that Gouffier's sympathies lay with Armfelt, the royalist. Gouffier painted two copies of this painting. And after Armfelt had to make a hasty departure from Florence in 1793, fleeing for his life, they were momentarily looked after by Lord Harvey. Yes, that Lord Harvey enemy of the French Republic. Gouffier's sympathies were not with Armfelt's embassy colleague, the untrustworthy Lagersvert, who was engineering his demise. Of course, Gouffier couldn't have made any of this too obvious or he'd have lost his commission. Lagersvert is portrayed in a directoire interior, less contemplative, with the usual view of the Duomo through the window. And look at his wig. It conveys artificiality and perhaps artifice. We'll touch again on wigs in a while. Artists finessed them when they wanted to. You'll find this in some of Gainsborough's portraits where they can be made to appear almost natural. But it's not unreasonable to conclude that Gouffier is making a point here. So it would be a mistake to look at these portraits simply as pre-romantic theatrical portraits. They convey political messages and could be said to touch raw political nerves given the times. So now we come back to the Websters. At the top of this slide, you can see what is known as Gouffier's portrait reductions. Look at the overall size of the canvas. It's even smaller than his preferred size of canvas for the portraits. Marmottan records that two other sketches like this one exist at Versailles. So Gouffier probably made about 30 similar portraits in all. Marmottan suggests that he made them to remind himself about what he had painted. And I'm showing you two examples here of the real portraits Gouffier painted. One of the opera singer, Mrs. Billington in Venice, and one of our Lady Webster, and which he has sketched, as you can see in his portrait reduction. But you can now identify across the canvas how Gouffier created a format for these portraits. He used his neoclassical training to create topical scenes for her, his peripatetic clients. He depicted them in the manner Fabre had portrayed Lord Holland, which I showed you earlier on in this talk, so that they could go home and say, the portrait for resemblance is everything his best friends could wish. And here is Sir Godfrey Webster, just like that. You would not guess at his irascible character or his other even less appealing habits from this fine portrait. He has his souvenir of Florence, the glory of Tuscany. He is dressed in the finest style, in nankeen breeches and white silk stockings with his right leg forward in a traditionally gentlemanly pose. A near landscape suggests classical erudition with a broken piece of pediment and the base of an antique column. The highly detailed depiction of nature in the foliage a neoclassical attention to detail, overtones of the Renaissance. Look at the detail in his gloves, the lace of his breeches, even the wrinkles in his stockings. He has a portrait miniature hanging from his waist and the immaculate line of the piping of his coat is virtuosic in its execution. His shoe buckles are worthy of the Kenwood shoe buckle collection, which by the way, is the greatest shoe buckle collection in the world. And then let's look at the detail in his hair, even if this is a blurry, blown up image. Or is it a wig? Well, it's a wig. It's what was considered to be well combed. It's a sign of conformity. It's a prerequisite of high society. It signifies power. And in the context of Italy and France in 1794, it's a symbol of anti-republicanism and monarchy. 
And just to remind you, the British in Florence were largely seen as opposed to the French Revolution. You could also perhaps discern a slight chinlessness in Sir Godfrey. One of the practical reasons why so many sitters of portraits were shown with their faces slightly turned was that before 19th century innovations in dentures, it was a better way of hiding lower jaw loss. So we'll leave him there, represented as he would have wanted to have been considered by his viewers before he had to deal with a more handsome rival for his wife's affections and before his habits led to his eventual ruin and demise. As for Gauthier, the appreciation of his contemporaries finally brought him to the notice of Monsieur Lebrun, husband of Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun, who wrote to Lucien Bonaparte, Minister of the Interior in 1800, saying he was worthy of being recalled to France. But it was too late. His ill health never left him. And on the 20th of October, 1801, he died in Livorno, aged 39, just three months after his wife, Pauline, had died, leaving their two children orphans. His daughter, Faustina, born in 1792, grew up under the care of Gouffier's comrade Desmarais and married in Lucca, and painted miniatures. She died in 1837. How good would it be if Kenwood could get hold of a portrait miniature by her for its collection? And what of the painting shared by Kenwood and Battle Abbey? Well, it's been used to fill in over the past few years when other paintings from Kenwood's world-class collection have been loaned to exhibitions. Now it gets its own chance to shine. An exhibition entitled a Journey Through Italy, Louis Gouffier, 1762 to 1801, was scheduled at the Musée Fabre in Montpellier from November 2020 until March 2021. Word is that it has been postponed until May 2022, and I really hope it will go ahead then. It will be the first retrospective of Gouffier's work. And as you'll have noticed from this talk, the Musée Fabre has a very fine collection of Gouffier's paintings. One of my great discoveries during the COVID pandemic has been the Musée Fabre's amazing website. And I'm going to book a ticket to Montpellier in summer 2022 to this exhibition. So there we are. When Kenwood finally reopens, Go and try and find this painting on the walls. Book a trip to France, or maybe even venture as far as Hastings further in the future. That's the end of my talk. Here are my sources, and thank you very much for listening.